it. Okay. You good? It's <clears throat> ready. Yep. Hey everyone, this is Anthony with Interviews at Everyday People. Um, we're here at Culture to Culture in Pottsville, sitting down with uh, two gentlemen. Uh, we'll, we'll have them introduce themselves in a second here, but we're just you know um, helping out with Culture to Culture and working with them to to break that stigma. Uh, everyone has their story. We're kind of joined together here on, on our journey to to let people you know share their expressions and share their stories and and, and help others. Um, so, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Bud Noel. Uh, It'll be uh, 12 years ago, on May 11th, that I lost my son, Tommy, uh, and never saw it coming. He, he had a, a two-year-old son that he absolutely adored, and uh, I used to ask him to go fishing with me. He said, I cannot pass the son off to somebody who want to spend all this time with him which made this so hard to believe, you know, that uh, without seeing a sign myself, he called me every day, he was a friend of mine, not only my son, we talked every day. I don't remember exactly, but we may have talked the same day that uh, he took his life. But uh, I got a call at four o'clock in the morning and uh, They said, Tommy's dead. And uh, I was sitting on my couch and I just uh, went blank. And it was just, uh, I felt pain like I've never felt in my life. And, it was, uh, and I, I was in disbelief and uh, I just didn't know what to do with it. And I. I sat in that couch the rest of the night. Somehow I fell asleep, woke up in the morning thinking it was a dream and realized it wasn't because I was out on the couch and I belonged on my bed. And, uh, <clears throat> proceeded to call my family and everyone else. And uh, And, uh, and it's, it's almost 12 years. It doesn't get any easier. No, absolutely uh, not. It does not get easier. It's, uh, but anyways, uh, my family came together. I have a great family. You know, uh, people could only wish to have a family like I do. I, I love my family. My family loves me. But they, they got together, and my, my son didn't have insurance, and they, they all came together and said, they put money up and said, just take your time and grieve, don't worry about this, we got it, you know, which made my life a little easier at that point, if there is such a thing. But, <clears throat> started making arrangements. And uh, got that done. Called the pastor to come to the house, you know. And uh, the pastor was coming, in, and it, I live on a little farm. And the farm, it was a rock. Grass needed to be cut, and the house needed to be cleaned up, and. Throughout all of this was going on, all my friends, true friends that I have in life today, and people could only wish to have the friends that I have in my life too. And, uh, asked me if I'm all right, do I need anything? And I said, no, I'm all right, I'm all right. And I was everything but all right, you know, and, and I needed a lot, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> I called the people up, I said, look, the pastor's coming to the house, the place needs it to be cleaned up. And 
grass needs to be cut. And so, and, uh, I probably had a dozen people at the house, a couple guys out on lawn tractors. And, uh, I cut some acreage, you know, and every, everybody came up. And the girls were in vacuuming and doing dishes and stuff like that, and the pastor came early. And she said, uh, what's all this? I said, that's uh, my friends came to my side when I needed them. She saw everybody doing everything, and it, she was just amazed and said, that is the best example of first century Christianity she's ever seen in her life, you know, and uh, I'm fortunate to have people like that in my life today, you know. Some people ask me if I was mad at God for taking my son. And I said, I'm not mad at God, and God did not take my son. He took his own life. You know? However, when God saw the pain I was in, he sent all his soldiers to come help me, like what's happening now. You know, and uh, <clears throat> I got through the burial and all of that, and, uh, trying to live my life. I realized I wasn't right. I didn't know how to grieve this, you know. And, uh, so I looked up a group called Compassionate Friends, and I, I went to them every month for maybe a year and a half or so. I don't, I'm not sure. Where are they located at? It. Uh, they meet in the former Pottsville Hospital on. Uh, I think it's the first Monday of the month. I haven't been there in a while, you know, but. Uh, is a good group because the only people that can understand losing a child are people who lost a child, you know, and it's a great group and it, it helped me tremendously. However, I needed more and I, and I took up a one-on-one -on -one counseling, you know, because I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't know how to grieve, you know, and, uh, through all of this, I got to grieve properly and get through this and be able to live my life, you know, and uh, without extreme pain. There's always pain there, you know, I think of it all the time. And uh, <clears throat> something good has come out of this, you know, uh, since that has happened, I've been able to make myself available for other people that's been going through this, you know, and I. And I go out of my way when I find out someone I know that happened to, and I, I'm there for them, you know. And uh, because again, the only people that can help someone that's been through this is someone that's been through it. And uh, <clears throat> the the greatest gift of all of this is uh, my grandson that was two years old when my son took his life. Today is my best friend. We go out to eat every Tuesday night, and, uh, and usually another night a week, he calls me up, you want to do something? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, they, yeah, really, when I was 14 years old, the last thing I wanted to do was hang around with an old fart like me. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm very blessed today to have that in my life, you know, and... Uh, I guess what, what needs to be said here is this. I didn't have a sign. If I did, I, I don't know. But it, if anyone has someone in their life that's showing signs of it, do not ignore it. You know, say something, talk to them, ask if they're all right or whatever. You know, and uh, try to save somebody from this. You know, there's... Uh, the world is not a better place without my son. I don't know if that's what he thought that night or what, but uh, he's dearly missed. You know, and uh, I hope I help someone. Thank you. Now, you you were talking a little bit in in during your 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 uh, on the stage um, that one of the biggest things that you say to other people that go through this is you know they always say if. Um, 
if everyone would just leave me alone, I'd, I would be able to get through it. And, and you made a really good analogy. Is this when you're going, when someone's going through this, or there's that loss and that grievance, but, or even, and you can relate that to depression or suicide. You know, some people say, oh, I'm going through it, just leave me alone. Um, that, how you were saying, that's an open wound. That's a wound, it's a heart wound mm -hmm. that needs attention. Yeah. And I realized that, and uh, the attention I got was through the group, uh, sharing in uh, the Compassionate Friends group, and, uh, with the, the counselor, mm -hmm. he cannot stuff this. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a, a, a wound in the heart that needs treatment. Yeah, you know? and it, it really does, and I and I know that that I and I I know it helped me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not I'm never get over this, but it, I got better. Yeah. A lot of people, they, they think, you know, um, when, when you're going through depression or grieving and, and you're, you're, you're not, they, they think I'm weak minded. You know, it's something that I, 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 if I, if I ask for help or if I look for support, I'm weak. And that's, and that it's when you go to the gym and you're bench pressing and you're, you have too much weight on, but it's something you can do. You just need that support. You need that guidance. You need that someone just to give you that spot. Spotter. And that's the same thing with it's same thing working on your mind. You you need that support system. You need to find that person that you do trust that you can put you can put you know a little bit of a weight on. Hey, I need you to I need you to spot me a little bit. I need you to take a little bit of this weight off me so I can get through this situation. Exactly. Yeah. Most men, especially men, say, "Oh, I'm all right. I got this." Mm -hmm. And it, I, I'm a man, and I I didn't have it. You know, I realized the pain, and it. I knew what I had to do. Yeah, and it, it doesn't make me less of a man to ask for help. It 100%. Does, you know, it does not, you know, and, it, and that's the problem with most men. They don't ask, I, I got this. And you, if, if you're a man and, and you ask for help, you're weak, is BS. I, I would 100% agree. I, I think that's a stigmatism that needs to be broken. Um, like I, like I, we talked about last time, growing up an Irish Italian. Like, listen, you're just you're oh, you're going through, so you're sad. You know, back in my day, you know what I mean. Like it's and yeah. it's just a generational thing. Like the, the generation before you tells you, listen, you think you have a bad. That's 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 something. That everyone's going through something, regardless of what time or what they're going. It to you maybe seems small, but to that person, it is something. You know, and you gotta you gotta support one another. You know, because that's where people can spiral. One of my pastors says, with men, iron sharpens iron. Yeah. It's being you asked to share between each other. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it's true. Yeah. You know, it, it makes me a lot stronger uh, to be close to other men and let people know who I am, all of me. Mm -hmm. And when I'm, when I'm hurting, I don't have this. Yeah. I don't have it. Somebody's got to know. Shared pain is cut in half. When you're stuffing something, you're holding all that pain for yourself. You give half of it to somebody just by talking about it. Yeah, the biggest thing is even uh, how you said iron sharpens iron. When you when when they're making a sword, when they're making something that's going to be super super strong, and they're making it fordable, they're they, what they do is they heat it up to the point where it breaks, and they break it, and then put the two pieces together, and then break it again, and then put those like so you you as a man, it, it's okay to break down, it's okay to get broken, it's okay to rebuild yourself because you are going to make yourself stronger, but don't be afraid to look for that help. Don't right. do it. Don't put the burden on your own shoulders. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you about telling your story. And, 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 you know, it is, you know, I've never dreamed of that. I've lost friends. I've had friends who took their, took, t taken their life. Suicide is something that I struggled with for a very long time. And, 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 and having that self-realization and hearing other people's stories and, and saying, hey, you know, this world isn't better without me. And it, that's good stuff to hear. It, it really, really is. And I appreciate you telling your story today. That all? It's still on. Yep. Tommy Z, I love you, brother. Thank you so much. All righty, uh, we're going to get to the second second uh, gentleman here, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, my name's Nathan Craig. Yeah, the closer we get you to it, that'll help you out, just way I can I can turn you down but have you up because of right. the music here, all right? So uh, t tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, uh, my name's Nathan Crick. I'm um, 39 years old. I'm from the Reading area. Um, <clears throat> for as long as I can remember, um, you know, the negative influences of drug and alcohol have played a part in my life. You know, I was raised in an abusive and alcoholic family. 
um, and that's that's all I ever known, you know. And I I really didn't see nothing wrong with it at the time because my parents always managed to keep their job and keep a, a roof over our heads and clothes on our back. But um, there was there was physical violence, there was verbal abuse, and and if it wasn't one of those two things, it was just absolute neglect. Um, you know, and that that became the normal thing to me that even when I branched out and started to have friends. Um, I was willing to take the abuse from them too, you know, so at that point I just wanted something that made me feel like I was the part of, you know, and not hurt so bad and not, not feel so, so much shame and guilt over who I was. And to not even know who I am at, at 12 or 13, but to feel ashamed of who I am, it's, 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 it's not a good place to be. Um, my drug and addiction, my drug addiction and, and alcoholism just grew by leaps and bounds at the time. Um, just rapidly progressed, um, always making bad decisions, um, never caring about anything other than myself. You know, I had a, a, a son when I was 15 years old, and, and I managed to stay in school, but um, I didn't I didn't care about him. I, I couldn't love him. Um, I had no desire to spend time with him. I had no desire to be financially responsible for him. My, my addiction was taking everything that I had to offer. Um, what age does your addiction start? Uh, I, I, was, I was at least 10 years old when I started stealing alcohol from my parents and hiding it and, and, and drinking it on my own. So it was readily, it was readily accessible. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. You know, and... and when they got sober when I was 12, I was angry because that, that was, you know, where I could get my quick fix from. Um, and, and, you know, my thinking back then was just, you know, it's, it's this disease of addiction, you know, it, it lives and dwells in the brain, you know, and, and to be 12 years old and to be thinking that, you know, me using and drinking with my parents was going to be the thing that brought us closer together, you know, to think like that at that age you know um and at the time like i didn't i didn't see nothing wrong that that seemed like a very logical very sane very mm -hmm. honest thought you know you have, to, you have to really take into consideration too you're you're 10 you know what i mean like so if if and this is not a knock against parents or your parents or anything but like if you're never taught you really don't know any better you're kind of just doing as you see and and how you were saying that you're 15 years old you know, you didn't care about your child. I mean, from an outside perspective, that's like, well, how could you? If you're never taught love, I mean, everything that as a child, fear, love, anger, that's 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 a they're taught they're natural emotions, but they're also taught emotions. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're never taught how to show compassion, if you're never taught how to care for somebody because you were never cared for, it's just you're just going by natural what's been natural to your entire life, and 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 to go through that at such a, a young age, it's, that's. It's pretty. It's it's remarkable where you are now. It really is. But I'm sorry. No, that's that's fine. And and you know, a after I graduated school and and I became you know technically an adult by all social standards, I'm I'm over 18 years old. You know, I I, I immediately just start going to jail. You know, I'm I'm willing to do anything to continue my addiction and my use. It doesn't it doesn't matter what it is. Um, and as as the time goes on you know I, I i was exposed to treatment and detox and meetings and and um over and over and over again you know outpatient inpatient um and there was always a sense that you know there was there was help to be had but i didn't want it you know i, I never i never even took the time to think that there was a legitimate different way to live you know, I, I almost accepted the fact that that was going to be my life. Um, I was going to either be homeless, in jail, or in treatment um, until one of those places became permanent or the grave. And, uh, you know, the, the time I spent in jail got longer and it became more serious. And, and the, time in the time in between my jail stints became very short and the time that I spent in jail became very long. Um, you know, and over over a 22 year period, I spent 17 of it incarcerated. Now, when you, when like I said, once another thing, but being taught, and, and and most of your time is in prison, so that's mostly what you know. When you came out, now they say the prison system is supposed to rehabilitate you. When you come out, what is the, what is like? Do you, is there an uncomfortability? Like I don't know how to handle the outside world because all you've known was was confinement. I, 
I'll definitely talk about this last time I, the, the last time I was incarcerated, you know, um, I spent six years at Greaterford State Prison. And up until that point, um, jail never really scared me. Um, I could always kind of weather the storm and manage it. I've always usually been able to make the best out of whatever situation I'm in, you know, um, and, and take care of myself. And that by far was the longest I ever spent in jail in a place that really opened my eyes. Um, it, it was like nothing I ever experienced before. You know, I actually started to be really concerned with my safety. Um, and not only my safety from other people, but even my safety from myself, because um, you become very animalistic. You know, you, you live in an open area with 500 plus people in this tiny confined area where nobody really cares about anybody else and it's literally survival of the fittest. And if you're not willing to live like that, like you're going to easily find yourself as prey, you know, and to spend that much time in that environment and then to come home and, you know, all I kept thinking the entire time I was away was, you know, it would be better, holidays would be better, birthdays would be better, everything would be better if I was home with my family. And I came home a week before Thanksgiving. And um, I remember I, I was at my family's house and, and he, he, you know, he, here it is, you know, my brother um, and his children, you know, my sister, her husband and, and her children, um, my aunts, my uncles, my parents, my grandparents, everybody is there. and I'm locked in my bedroom having the worst anxiety and panic attacks I could believe. I could not even be comfortable around my family. I felt so out of place. I couldn't. You know, even even leading up to that, you know, I, I couldn't get in elevators. I couldn't be in waiting rooms. I couldn't get on the bus. I could not feel comfortable being in open spaces with people and not feeling like I had to pay attention to every single thing that was going on around me. Um, and to be in my family's house at, at, at a holiday and to just, like, literally just not be able to just be there, that I had to be in my room. And I remember my mother came down and she knocked on my door and I let her in and we had this... We had this very real conversation, you know, where we sat there crying to each other and I looked at her and I told my mom, I said, mom, you know, I'm 37 years old and I feel like we don't even know each other, that if you even had an idea of who I really am, you would never let me in your house. I don't know that someone's in there. There's someone in there now, but yeah, you're you know, good to go. And we just, we cried and she told me it was going to be okay. And that, that was like shortly after that is when I relapsed again. You know, I just, I was unable to cope with not being in jail. You know, it, it, I literally had spent that much time that it was easier and more manageable for me to be in jail than be out of jail, you know, and, and to compound it with trying to find a job and trying to fit in with, with friends and then just, you know, finding out over and over and over again that the people that I was associated with or that I did know and that I was friends with, they were all dying of overdose the entire time I was in jail. You know, to come home and, and realize that some of my best friends, people that I really loved, were no longer even alive. And that I spent all that time in there, cut off from society and even knowing that they were passed away. You know, and it's, it still happens. It still happens every week. I, I, I find out about somebody else that I was, I was really friends with that's no longer here. You know? Um, yeah, I, it's... That that the like I said like that's what I want people to understand like when when someone goes to prison they're not always bad people they they may have made a bad decision and and that decision could have been a decision you made that night I mean it doesn't take much to, to get yourself in that and caught in that system and then once you're in that system you you when you try to come out and then reestablish yourself as a person you're still labeled as what you were even though you paid your times it's hard to get a job it's hard so a lot of the a lot of people who go through that system end up going back to what they're comfortable because they. Know Know, hey, I can't get a job here, but I know if I go back out and do what I was doing before, I'm, I'm, I, I, it's, that's what I know. Um, when you were in, you said you, you know, you, when you were in there and you could that light switch moment hit for you, could you remember what that moment was or what that experience was that that kind of said, hey, I want to kind of change who I am or the, the way I'm going about things? Um, I, I, you know what really did it? Um, being that close to people and having no choice and who I was around and what I was experiencing, um, I, I really started to dislike people. You know, I've really, really started to want to alienate myself to such a degree where, like, to me, a good day is if nobody even said anything to me. 
and then staying in that you know and just locked in a cell and all, all you have to do is either fantasize and reminisce about the past or to begin to plan and think about your future there, there there's really nothing else to do mm-hmm. and um i just knew you know the danger level was very high my irritability and tolerance which you know my tolerance and patience was always very high but that amount of time it was just chipped away and chipped away and chipped away to the point where i just i got to a point where i really felt and believed that i would rather die than have to go back to jail absolutely rather die than go back to jail and you know after i came home even when i had relapsed and begun using again the willingness that i used to have to do whatever it took to get my next fix it was not it was not there anymore you know and and i remember sharing with somebody like i wish that my fear over using was more than my fear over going back to jail yeah. you know because like if you told me like well you know would you use again you know I would I would very much start to juggle this idea well maybe I can call, control it maybe I can do this maybe to be different maybe for, for maybe whatever there. but if you told me like am I willing to go back to jail absolutely not I would rather die mm-hmm. you know and and by God's grace you know I've I've been out of the out of the system for over two years now so long as I've ever stayed out of jail you know I, I, I came home in 2016 and I, I haven't had on a pair of handcuffs since and it, it amazes me when I when I sit back and I really really think about the amount of time I spent in jail and how rapid my recidivism always was and how quickly I always went back to be sitting here two plus years without going back it absolutely amazes me now you said, uh, you know, you told a story. You had a, you, you suffered with suicide as, as yes. well, and, and suicidal thoughts and depression, and anxiety. Um, you said you, during your story, you, you, you want to tell a little bit. Are you comfortable telling that story? Yeah, yeah. I um, you know, after I had I had come home and, and everything was going the way it was going, and, and I didn't feel right. I mean, I, I didn't fit in. Um, I had no support. You know, I had no real friends. Uh, completely felt alienated and not comfortable around my family. I definitely couldn't tell them that um, that mentally I, I was struggling. I couldn't. I couldn't tell them that the fear of telling them that I was thinking about using. You know, m- my thought was, oh, they would just put me out. You know, so I didn't. I didn't share it with anybody. I didn't have anybody to share it with. Um, you know, and I struggled. It took me three months to find a job and, and just going through that process of being like ground up and beat up and, and just feeling ashamed and guilty about something that was in my past and having it define me and who I am. You know, by the time I finally got a job and got my first check paycheck, you know, the, 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 the <laughs> I was primed and ready to go. Um, and, I, and I started using and, and I just realized like, you know, this is, this is so bad. I don't want to do this. Um, I, I caught a little bit of habit and money was going way too quickly and for the first time ever I told my family like I, I need help I'm using again I want to stop I don't know how to stop you know and they they had sent me to treatment I spent a year in treatment um, completely removed from everything no cell phone no nicotine no women no I mean I was completely cut off from everything and just I had this year to spend developing a relationship with my peers and with a god of my understanding and and my, my thinking and, and my thought, thought process like drastically changed. You know, I experienced like ministry and opportunities to serve in my community and um, the relationship with my family got better. All, all these things got better. Um, but yet at the same time, because I was in a bubble, I wasn't really dealing with the things that I always, always struggled with. You know, when I graduated that program and came home, I, had, I went from, from having no real control, no real freedom, um, not really having access to transportation, money, none of that stuff to having free reign over all of it. You know, I, I graduated a program on a Friday night. I went to work that Sunday night. You know, I came home. I, I had a vehicle. Um, I had money in my pocket. I had, I, I had an amazing fresh start, but I was unable to be responsible and mature with it. And it was just way too much for me to handle. And, and I relapsed like right away, relapsed. Um, and I felt so ashamed over it that 
to me, there was no way that I could go back and tell my family, like, I'm using again, you know? So I just manipulated and hid as much as I could. You know, I quit my job. I got my last paycheck. I left. Um, and I just, I used for a couple days. And then I, I, I finally, I found myself completely alone on this bridge outside of Reading on, like, a, a bike trail in, like, a nature hike area. And, um, you know, I had a pocket full of money, a pocket full of drugs. And... I have nowhere to go, you know, I have nowhere to sleep, I have nowhere to eat, um, I have n none of those things, and none of those things were ever important before, as long as I had money and drugs, nothing else was important, and I was sitting there on that bridge, and, and you know, I, I, I looked at the condition of everything, and I realized that, like, what had always been my solution, what had always been the thing that I thought I always, always wanted, was no longer going to do what it did for me before. And at that moment, that that facade of, of drugs being my solution, it was just shattered, completely shattered. You know, because it was only before when I felt bad about my actions was after I got caught or after the party was over. The only time I ever would think about going to treatment was when I ran out of drugs or asking for help. You know, when all resources were exhausted, then it was a different story. But here I was with a pocket full of money, a pocket full of drugs, and realizing that it's it's not it's not doing what I always thought it had done. And I didn't know what else to do at that point. And I just wanted it to end. You know, so I, I, I took all the heroin I had and I mixed it up. And after I had mixed it, before I had done it, you know, a, a gentleman stopped. It was the only person I seen that entire day. And he, he like, looked right at me. And he was like, are, are you okay? You know, and I, I tried to play it off. Like, yeah, I'm fine. What are you talking about? You know, like, it's just, it, it, it seems so random. But in hindsight, there was really nothing random about it. Like, I was in really bad, bad spiritual shape that it must have been raiding, aiding off of me. Um, you know, and I told him, no, I was fine, you know, and he had told me if I, if I needed to talk, he would, he would listen. And I told him I was fine and he left and, and I, I proceeded to, to take my shot. And I don't, I don't know how long I was out for. Um, I just know I woke up violently sick, um, very incoherent, uh, poor motor function, um, trouble breathing, you know, it took me a while to really get my bearings. And, and when I finally came down enough to really realize what was going on you know I just realized that I was still alive and I didn't want to be alive and at this point I, I really really didn't know what to do with myself you know I, I I no longer wanted to live but I no longer had the ability to carry it out in such a way where it wasn't going to be super violent you know that, not to sound morbid but one of the things I always struggled with I always said like um if I did it I didn't want the person who are, are my friends and family when they do find me that they're like that image is going to be horrifying to them and I don't want to sound super graphic when I say it but that's one of the main reasons why I like but I never took drugs or anything like that but like I was like well I can't shoot myself because I don't want people to see that like they, I, you know what I mean and that's so you were at that point as well yes. yeah you know I, I definitely believed that people would be better off you know because just back and forth over that amount of time you know, and, and there were there were there were a few times in my life where I, I put together some time sober. I put together, you know, a job or a vehicle or, you know, just just enough time for people to really think that something was gonna change, just to return right back to the mess. Mm -hmm. Time and time and you know, my, my addiction spanned more than twenty, twenty five years, you know. Um, so I finally, I finally really kind of like know what's going on and I really didn't know what else to do and I, I took everything I had left, you know, all my drugs, my paraphernalia, everything I had and I threw it off the bridge and I'd walk to my family's house and, and I knocked on the door and they immediately wanted to take me back to treatment. Um, and, you know, and I fought and argued and, you know, I, I didn't want to go where I had just came from, you know, and that was the only place that they were willing to take me. And um, I finally just gave in and I went. And, um, you know, when I got there, I, f I found out, you know, one of, one of the, one of the pretty, pretty much one of the main people from there, he came in, you know, it, you know, word spreads, you know, the, the program I was in had tw 120 plus men in it. You know, word spread pretty fast that I was in the intake office, getting an intake, that I was in bad shape. Um, you know, and one of the, one of the main people, he's like literally like second or third in command at the program. Like he, 
he came to me and he gave me a hug and he told me that he loved me and that he was there for me you know and he had he had told me about somebody that I had graduated with um, literally at the same time that I was trying to kill myself he he overdosed you know and he was he was an intern in their program and he and he left and you know he took back his will and he decided that he was going to do something different and, and it, I, I've spoken to his family like he didn't want his life to end you know he was just back in his mess again and there there I was trying to kill myself and was unable to carry it out or unable to see it through and he just wanted to escape his pain and he lost his life and it just it, it rocked me you know and I, and I sat there in treatment for over a month and I just I didn't want to live yet I was too afraid to die and in that hopelessness and indifference I just I didn't know what else to do I just I just sat there and hope that something would change. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know how it was going to come. You know, and I was very honest, like, with everybody who would ask me, you know, they would say, you know, how are you doing? And I'd say, I'm doing horrible. Was was that the first time in, in your life and going through this that you opened up with your honesty and saying, I'm not okay, I need help, instead of bottling it? So you, you were more outward thinking, like, hey, this is, you're reaching out more. I, I think... You know, the only times I was really willing to open up and tell people that I was hurting inside is if I knew they were hurting the same way I was. Mm -hmm. You know, so there. So you, that sorry, so that was like one of the biggest things in like in, in prison or stuff is like you don't trust, you don't absolutely never not. let anybody else in. So for somebody to open up to you and say, "Hey, I, like that was your way of saying, "Hey, I trust you enough to bring you in on this." You know what I mean? And that, and then you became more outward. Where hey, anyone like if somebody was asking, you were like, "Yes," and I'm. I need help. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, previously before that point, you know, I, the, the people I was willing to open up and, and say that I was not okay, that I needed help were people who were incapable. They were in the same mess I was. They were incapable of helping me. And I don't know if that plays a part in me being comfortable because, you know, the truth is like you, you can try to help somebody as much as you want, but until they really want the help, like there's, there's not much that you yeah, can they, do. They gotta, that goes with everything, even with addiction or depression or any, anything like that. Like, you're, you're, there's no magic word or phrase you're gonna say to say that, that you're gonna make them go, oh, that's that's it. You know what I mean? Like people kind of have to figure it out and become self-aware and be willing to break that barrier down to say, I need help. I have an issue, and I think that's that's the point you got to get to to before you can get better. Would you would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. Like even with the anxiety and depression for me, until I openly talked about it, because for the longest time, like I'm not telling people I suffer with, you know, suicidal thoughts, depression, or anxiety, because they're gonna think I'm crazy. But the second you you do that, it's like you you become free. Like it's like the genie's out of the bottle, and you're and and you're and you're no longer confined, or you have that weight on you. Because now you're gonna have that point where you're gonna have people ask more questions and say, hey, are you okay? But that's what you kind of need. You need that support system, and any support system is strong. Absolutely. And I mean, I, I, I could share this story. I, I remember, you know, uh, growing up, you know, I have an older sister. We're only about a year, a little over a year apart. And, you know, so we were raised in the exact same environment, you know, and like I shared before, you know, when I thought when I was angry that my parents were getting sober because I thought that was going to be the thing that bridges us together. She was ecstatic that they were getting sober, you know, and, you know, even even at one point when my parents got sober because my mom got sober slightly before my father there, there was almost a divorce and I remember me and my sister having a conversation about who we would go and live with and she would go and live with mom because she was getting sober and I would go and live with dad because he was going to probably remain drinking and be at work all the time and not be in my face you know to be to be raised in the same environment and to think so differently you know we were so close like when my parents were abusive like we had each other's back we would take beatings for each other if one of us was already in trouble and the other one was about to get in trouble we would step in and take the rap you know we always tried to have each other's back growing up we were super close you know and and once all this began to change and once once we got a little bit older and we kind of like even living in the same house just kind of went our separate ways you know she became like an athlete and very academic and 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 that was that was her that was her escape and mine was using and being the stoner and not caring about school and and skipping and doing all that you know um, we had drifted so far apart and then I, I begun to get even worse and worse and the jail and, and the treatment all came in and then then finally at some point I remember um, I actually had the opportunity to sit down with my sister and I remember being so resentful feeling that like she didn't love me 
um, that she didn't care about me, feeling all these different things. And I remember when we finally had a conversation and I had asked her, um, I literally looked right at her and asked her like why she hate me and she broke down with tears and she told me that she loved me so much and she had no idea how to help me. And it just kept her in that spot. And to think like how off my perception was because of what I'm experiencing, not, not even to realize that like all that time she wanted to help me, that all I had to do was ask for her help and she would have done anything to help me, you know? But I didn't want the help. The, the absolute like the absolute power of, of just a conversation is is so so important and it can it can go it could be so broad too like if, if with differences or opinions or just needing that help or just breaking down and saying I need that help just that that ability to, to just let yourself free and have an open conversation with somebody is just super super powerful and that's a huge reason why I support this culture conversation cafe and culture to culture as well as me starting my podcast because people hearing people interact and hearing people talk and even if you're not going through what we're going through but you listen from an outside perspective it's powerful and it says okay maybe i'm not going through it now but i know if some of that is you know what i mean and that's that's the the overall goal to this whole project is just really really helping people and your story is phenomenal man and i'm super super happy that you're you know you're, you're on the right track and you're doing the right the right things and, and you're you are aware that your journey is not over it's just beginning um and i you're very you're a very educated man you're very smart very well spoken and and if everything you went through i, I really think you're gonna you have a a, a purpose of here and, and and it is helping people and, and helping people go through that the only question i have is just kind of follow up with your story a little bit you said your relationship now with your family is is better than it's ever been oh my god it's amazing and because you opened that door and you you did put those barriers up well you know like i i think one of the greatest things to happen in this last um I, i'm just going to specifically talk about the last 10 months i've been in this treatment program you know i i legit wanted to be that guy that just lived in his parents basement my entire life and didn't really have to worry about financial responsibilities and or any responsibilities like that's what i wanted mm -hmm. and in 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 almost a way like always being invited to come back and live in their house until i got on my feet um not that it was intentional in any way but it was always one of the things that really held me back you know, I never really gained any level of independence. Mm -hmm. And anything I got handed, anything I had was normally kind of given to me or handed to me. And I had no real gratitude for it. I didn't work for it. And of course, like, I, I'm going to give it right away. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and here I am in this program. You know, if I don't pay my rent, I'm on the street. Yeah. You know, if I don't get up and go to work, I don't have a job. You know, mm -hmm. nobody is really holding my hand. People are supporting me. But nobody's making me do anything that I don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And just not living in their house and being independent and, and, and literally having to take some authority in my own life and, and make this happen. And for them to be, you know, out from underneath my, my rain cloud and for me to be out from underneath their shadow has really been the thing that has brought us really close together that, you know, when I lived in their house, they were gripped by fear. They never knew what was going to happen. You know, and I kept them in that spot year after year after year. So for me to be going through all these changes and to, and to growing in all areas of my life and for them to be able to be on the outside and not be um, living in fear through it and being able to just experience it in, in everything that it, that, that it is up until that point um, has really been the thing that has allowed us to communicate better. Um, to love each other better, to be more honest with each other, you know, um, for them to want me to come around. Like, they're always so curious what's going on in my life, you know, because everything is changing and moving forward, you know, and I don't, I don't get to tell them about everything I got going on, you know, until after it already happens. You know, and it's it's to be invited over for holidays and just to stop by for dinner and, hey, what are you doing? You know, I miss you, son. Why don't you please come over to the house? You know, whereas before it would be, I miss you. I haven't seen you in a month. Nobody knows where you are. Yeah. You know, they know where I am. They know I'm doing well. They can rest at night knowing that I'm finally living a, a, a life that they can be proud of, you know. 
it's, they're getting more of a day by day. Hey, my, my my everything's going good instead of hey, you know, it's been three months and here's all the like. You're, you're no longer your they're, they're, your catch up moments aren't. I got to catch you up on negativity. Your catch up is like I had a good day today. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Like that's 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 awesome. Mm-hmm. That's super cool. I I'm I'm very happy. Like I. I'm, uh, it's, it's just a, it's powerful. I could relate not so much with the the alcohol, the, the you know the addiction part, but just the family thing. It's something that resonates really strong with me. Um, you know, I, I, I there's a whole thing, but we, you know, but it's not about me today. But uh, uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm it's awesome, man. I, I I really have no words to really put into it for the first time in forever. But it's just really really good that you know I'm, I'm, I'm I want to keep in contact with you, and I definitely want to. And if you ever need to talk, man, well, social media, the whole Absolutely. thing, and you have you have you know i think you're very you can help a lot of people and one of the biggest things that i've learned um like i said i never personally dealt with addiction or struggle with anything like that but one of the biggest things that outside people who don't who've never done that their biggest thing is is well, why would someone do heroin why would somebody go into that i mean heroin's not a party drug people aren't doing heroin to say let's have a good time and and let's hang out and have a blast that is something that someone's doing because they're trying to escape something else that that is uh, you know i mean like so when someone says oh you were a heroin addict like people think oh you're it's it's not like you're smoking weed or doing coke and you're trying to you know get through your day i mean there's people who use that crutch as well but it's a lot of the things that i've learned for people that go through addiction is they had mental issues they were going through something like anxiety depression suicide and 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 heroin they tried and it became well they mostly start with pills and then they go with the heroin or but it's 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 an escape for them, you know. And I and I really want people to to learn that that that's not the case when you hear someone's an, an addict or going recovering from addiction. It's not that, you know. Hey, I, I did it because it was so much fun. And it wasn't. It was an escape. And 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 to realize that you're now taking those right steps and and working on your mental aspect and working on making yourself strong on those aspects, you're gonna grow as a person. And I, I thank you so much for your story. And like I said, I we I definitely want to keep in contact, and cause it's not over, you know. And anytime you can reach out and help uh, help somebody, I you know I I think that's going to be a good thing for you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your story, thank you. brother. Thank you, seriously. Just stop it for now, and then we'll pick it up from there.